co-chair and friend Pierre Guillaman to introduce the, the first plenary session. Thanks everybody and have a beautiful week. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues. So this is, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the first uh, round table of the day, space missions, made and long-term policies in which uh, Mr. Dordain, Mr. Legal, Mr. Warner, Mr. Gazarek, Mr. Parker, and Mr. Battiston will share with us their views on space missions policies. So this session will be moderated by Mr. Barensky, so please, I give you the floor for uh, one hour and a half. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stefan Berensky. I'm a French journalist. I've been covering space uh, affairs for more than 20 years now. And I must confess, I'm really fond of space propulsion. Well, maybe it's because my grandfather was a plumber. And today, when I see uh, cryogenic engines, I can't help but I see the ultimate descendants of his boilers. Uh, in another life, I also been teaching mathematics and physics. And when I look at solid propulsion and uh, electric propulsion, I think at all the nasty questions I could have asked to my students about uh, uh, solid propellant geometry or the physics of uh, plasma propulsion, which I would have a hard time explaining myself. And uh, well, I guess we all have our reasons for loving space engines and space propulsion systems. Uh, but behind all these wonderful systems, we have to remember that they've been developed for a purpose. And this purpose is to serve missions. And these missions are to serve policies. So today we have a, a panel of high-level specialists and executives, and with them, I'd like to discuss the rationale behind the future propulsion systems, both for launchers and spacecraft. Uh, so with us today, we have, of course, Jean-Jacques Dordain, Director General of the European Space Agency, Jean-Yves Le Gall, President of the French Space Agency, CNES, Dr. Johann Werner, Chairman of the Executive Board of DLR. Mike Gasserich, Associate Administrator for Space Technology Mission Directorate of NASA. David Parker, Chief Executive of the United Kingdom Space Agency. And the newly appointed uh, President of the Italian Space Agency, Mr. Roberto Battiston. Well, I could not find uh, a good order to introduce you. So I will keep the one, the three AF prepared for me, and I give the floor to Jean-Jacques. You will all have about eight minutes to prepare, to prepare for your presentation, and after that, we'll go to Q and A's. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you very much. As I said in my introduction, uh, propulsion is present in all stage of all space missions starting with the launchers and uh, continuing with satellites operations, spacecraft operations for exploration, meaning that uh, propulsion provides end-to-end -end access to space for all missions. So speaking of space missions, uh, I think that we can divide the space missions in three different 
segments, each of them having different requirements. First, the government missions, for which access to space has a strategic value. Non-dependence should be the driver, and we, we see these very days the value of non-dependence. The second segment is made of commercial missions, for which access to space has an economic value, meaning that competitiveness should be the driver according to a business case which must be profitable. And the third segment is exploration missions, for which access to space has an enabling value. And cooperation should be the driver. So I have separated the space missions in these three segments because I think that uh, uh, it's much better to, uh, to make this difference when you are looking at propulsion. So today, the prospects on each segment of these space missions are different because uh, we have to speak of mid and long term. I must say that I don't know what you mean by mid and what you mean by long, but okay, I, uh, I assume that mid is 10 years and long is beyond 10 years, but uh, this is my definition. Uh, now, uh, you know that my long term view is one year for me. So, uh, but uh, for government missions, I can say that the government missions can be predicted, predicted for the next 10 years with some good accuracy. As a matter of fact, the science missions be there for the universe, for the solar system, for planet Earth, which we call Earth explorers in ESA missions are almost already defined until 2025. So the science missions are what they are until 2025. And beyond 2025, I think that there will not be dramatic changes. This is the same for the services, the public service missions. Meteorology, we have on, in Europe the Meteosat third generation, the METOP second generation, and that covers also the full period until 2025 and even beyond. For Copernicus, we have started to launch the Sentinels uh, starting uh, last uh, 3rd of April with uh, Sentinel 1A. But for Copernicus, Copernicus will be a 20 satellites in orbit, more or less, 10 years of uh, duration of life, meaning two satellites per year for Copernicus. Galileo, the same, 30 satellites in orbit, 10 years of duration of life, three satellites per year. Maybe less accurate for the defense missions, this is not my specialty, or at least it's not anymore my specialty, but uh, telecommunications, Earth observation for uh, defense missions, intelligence are uh, maybe less uh, predictable. But I can say that government missions are predictable. On the contrary, the commercial missions are much more difficult to predict. When you consider that in the last two years there were dramatic changes in uh, the commercial missions and especially the telecommunications, uh, which is the biggest part of the commercial missions, meaning that uh, we have quick evolutions because this is market driven and the biggest competitor of uh, telecommunication in space are telecommunications ground based meaning that the space-based telecommunications, they have to, to compete with the ground-based telecommunication, meaning that the evolutions are much quicker. 
and there are also cycles in uh, uh, the uh, commercial missions. Much more difficult to predict what will be the uh, commercial missions uh, beyond 2020. Then you have the exploration missions. We have the International Space Station. We have Moon, Mars, asteroids. Uncertainties are much more related to the geopolitical situation. Because as I said, cooperation is a driver. Cooperation is uh, important. Cooperation is uh, even mandatory. But obviously, cooperation is uh, connected with the uh, political constraints. And also budget constraints. Or the partner can reopen the, uh, the prospects for exploration missions. It was the case for ExoMars a couple of years ago. It is the case today for ISS beyond 2020. So not easy to find uh, what exploration missions will be there beyond 2020. Now, whatever exploration missions we are looking at, cooperation on transportation is mandatory. I have said that many times. I cannot consider that uh, we shall embark into uh, major exploration missions without cooperation on transportation. Cooperation has started, in particular on star standardization of interface, which is a key for cooperation. You have to realize that when we launch ATV to the uh, International Space Station, we can dock only to a Russian docking port. We cannot dock to another docking port because there is no standard interface. So we are working collectively on standardization. And we have embarked with NASA into a cooperation on transportation with the service module of Orion, which will be provided by ESA, which is a significant step. I would even say an historical step in the cooperation on transportation for exploration. So this is basically, I have tried to, to, uh, to, to provide a picture on the uh, space missions in the mid and long term. But to make the prospects even more complex, there is less and less a clear cut between launchers and satellites. And this is certainly the uh, interest of this conference is to put together launchers and satellites for what proportion is concerned. I have told you that I have a long, unfortunately, a long history in uh, propulsion and launchers. And I am coming from a period where for the launcher family, the satellite was just a constraint. And, uh, and uh, from a period for which, the, for the satellite family, the launchers was just uh, a truck that they can find all over the world. Today, this borderline between the truck, the launcher, and the satellite or the spacecraft is more and more difficult to draw. And this borderline can evolve and is evolving as we are experiencing today with a more